my name is Nehemiah, and I volunteer with our welcome party team at the Austin campus. I just wanted to take a minute and say thank you for joining us this weekend. Before we jump into service, we wanted to let you know how loved, welcomed, and valued you are in this place. We are so glad that you are here. Our worship experience is designed to help you connect with the Lord in a personal way. So please, find your seat, silence those phones, and try to limit other distractions. Please join us on your feet. Let's worship.
You know, I love the simplicity of those lyrics we just sang. Sometimes all you got is we just love you. God, I just love you. I just do. I don't got a seminary degree. I don't got big, fancy theological words, but I just know I love you. And that right there is a great prayer and a great line to sing. Amen. Hey, you guys feel good? Excited to be in church? Let's go. Hey, help me out. We exist to make heaven more crowded by helping people to know God, live on purpose, and be part of something that is changing the world. This is imperfect people pursuing a perfect God. That's all the church is. It's true about every church. We just love to shout it from the mountaintop around here. So you're welcome here. I'm glad you're here. I did want to point out two teams that we have, our parking team and our ushers team. Can we make some noise for them? At the 1015, man. I think we underestimate how challenging it is to do what those teams do at this service. And I thought that we would help them out by doing what we call around here the Red Rock Shuffle in every seat full, because we have a lot more people trickling in. So this section over here, if y'all could scoot to the middle of the room so we can leave some seats on the side. And same with this section over here, scoot to the middle. Let's leave some chairs on the, on the ends. And then in the middle, if you could just shuffle into the middle, guys, every seat that you got. This is like when you're flying Southwest and the flight attendants say, uh, don't even bother not making eye contact with people, hoping they're just gonna walk by you because this is a full flight. All right, this service is a full flight. We're glad that you're here. Man, and happy Palm Sunday, by the way. This is the start of Holy Week, the week that has in every way imaginable changed the course of human history. That one man 2,000 years ago, born poor on the other side of the world with no platform or prominence, has divided history in half, B.C., A.D. And every tribe, every tongue, every nation, every religion is telling time right now based on the man, Jesus Christ, the God-man, Jesus Christ, that we are here to worship today. And this week, the most epic journey, the most epic journey that I'm praying, I am praying becomes a little bit more personal for you this week, that you don't just experience Holy Week and Good Friday and Easter and Palm Sunday because you like watched it or observed it on a movie screen or even read about it in scripture, but those things would become avenues and tools to help you almost get into it. The five senses that God gave you. I want you to, can you smell it? Can you hear it? Can you taste it? Can you see it? Everything that your savior did for you because he did not just die for you. It's even more personal than that. He died almost as you, as you. Did the, the death that I deserve, he, des he died as me. That 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 says, he who knew no sin, meaning Jesus, actually became. He didn't just have it on his shoulders. He became all of my sin and in exchange imputed to me the righteousness of God. And so I hope that this story for you this week gets even more personal because make no mistake about it, it was not nails that pinned him to a cross. It was his love for you. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me. I give it, I lay it down. In other words, this is no murder. This is a sacrifice, the greatest sacrifice ever, a perfect sacrifice by a perfect person to perfect some very imperfect people like you and me who just love gathering together to worship our perfect God, amen? Should we do this? We're gonna do one more song. Let's invite the presence of God into this place today. Holy Spirit, we love you. And I know that you're here because you're everywhere. And you know you're needed, but also know above and beyond that, that you are wanted in this place. I pray that you would create a unique service right now because you know all the stories of everybody in these chairs watching online at GBB. And so we pray that dangerous prayer and say, have your way, do what you wanna do. We love you, we worship you. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's worship.
Jesus, the King of Kings, 
Jesus, the light of the world, the bread of life, the door, and as we will dive into today, the good shepherd. I'm glad you're here today. I'm glad to be part of this family, or I should say flock today, because we're talking shepherd lingo, and I'm thankful for all of you in this place, but we need to welcome some other important people. Everybody in overflow upstairs right now, welcome to church. Everybody joining us online right now, welcome to church. And let's ramp this up for our campus up in Gatesville, Texas, our God Behind Bars campus. We love you so much, Murray Unit, we love you. We are so grateful that we get to be one Red Rocks family and worship together. I'm gonna read to you as we're in this moment of worship. Make sure I get the right part. I'm gonna read to you the passage that this message is rooted out of from John chapter 10, starting in verse 10. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, this is Jesus talking, that they may have a life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my Father. So Jesus, we thank you that you are the good shepherd. We thank you that you came here for us to lay your life down for us. We wanna be led by you. We wanna hear what you have to say. So we seek you, would you speak to us and move in this time in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, say hi to somebody, grab a seat. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, which means you are sheep. We are sheep. Some people take that as an insult, like Jesus is attacking our intelligence, because I don't know if you know, but sheep are not the brightest animals on the planet. But I don't think that Jesus is attacking our intelligence when he says this. I think he's opening up to us a metaphor, an amazing relationship, and who he is. The point of him saying, I am the good shepherd, is actually much more about the shepherd than it is about us. And we're gonna focus on the shepherd today, but when it comes to us, I don't think that he's just saying, you guys are dumb. If he wanted to, he probably could have used a dumber animal, like bugs or fish that have like no brains, if that was really his point. If he's going the mammal route, here's what Jesus, if he wanted to insult you, this is what he would have said, I am the good koala caretaker. Because you may not know this, but koalas are some of the dumbest animals on the planet. I learned this in my research this week on dumb animals. It's important for a sermon. Let's bring up a picture of a koala, just so in case anyone in the room somehow doesn't know what a koala looks like, there's one. And you're like, oh, they're cute. And then you look in its eyes and you're like, mm, yeah, probably not a lot going on there. <laughs> Here's what I learned about koalas. As you can see in this picture, they eat eucalyptus leaves that are poisonous, toxic, not nutritional. That's their diet. So that's an indicator. But here's how we really know that they're not very smart. They have some of the smallest brain mass to body mass ratio of any mammal. The giveaway is that their brains are smooth. So our brains are wrinkled brains. We have like, you know, it looks like a folded brain is what it's called because there's lots of neurons and activity and things running around. We have a prefrontal cortex. A koala's brain is more like a little pink bar of soap. Incredibly smooth, not much activity happening, eats something that's not good for it, sleeps about 20 hours a day, which kind of sounds awesome, because it is tiring to be alive. They don't do a whole lot. Here's my favorite thing I learned about koalas. They don't understand the concept of rain. So it will start raining and they'll be in the rain and they'll just be like, hmm, this is different. <laughs> and that's it. They won't have the intelligence to move to shelter. They, won't th they just don't even know what's going on. You can pick a, a eucalyptus leaf off of a branch because they eat off of the branches, that's what they do, but you could pick a leaf and hand it to it and it won't eat it because it won't know what you're handing it. It could watch you do it and it will not connect the dots. All of this to say, 
Now you know a little more about koalas. If Jesus wanted to insult your intelligence, he would have called you a koala. But he calls us sheep. And I think it indicates the relationship that he wants to have with us, but it also points to something that we do have in common with sheep. And it's this, sheep are prone to wander and need to be led, are designed to be led. Prone to wander and need to be led, which I think is probably true for every single one of us. We're not so different. And so let me ask you this question, who is leading you? Who is leading in your life? You are following someone or something. You are being led. Maybe it's culture. Maybe your life consists of cultural shepherding, that whatever culture is saying, whatever's normalized in our culture, that that is what your life looks like. You are shaped and formed by the culture that you live within. You are a cultural sheep. Maybe it's influential people, influencers on social media or celebrities, someone you consider powerful, prominent, and it's really kind of their opinions and how they go about things that shape how you then go about things. You follow that lead. Someone you consider important, powerful, prominent. It's interesting to me, a lot of people like, they'll align something like how they vote with how a celebrity that they like votes. Though that celebrity may have no expertise in that area, but because that person seems important to me, then I'm gonna believe what they have to say or what they think. So maybe it's influential people. This is why cults are really easy to start. Because if you've got a little charisma and you seem like you know a little more than other people, you've got a little extra, people will follow you because we are designed to be led. And we will follow shepherds. In this country, it could be politics are your shepherd. A lot of political shepherding that for you, it may be that you have picked a side and the majority of your identity and how you view the world and how you go about things is rooted in that camp that you fall in. You are a political sheep. Maybe it's the media, the outlets you go to for news and information, the things that you take in, each with their own bias that forms you and shapes how you think and then how you go and live your life. You're a sheep of PR. It may be that you are shepherded by the algorithm more than anything else, that that is the thing that is feeding and leading your life with that silent, sinister scroll every single day feeding you more and more stuff. You read about sheep, and one of the things that, that they kind of lack when it comes to intelligence, one of the things that they do showing that they need to be led is they could be put in a pasture, and they'll eat all the grass, and then when it's gone, if they're not led, they won't think to go find more. They will just start eating the grass that has exited other sheep's bodies to their demise. Kind of like the pollution that we just take in and take in and consume in the world. So maybe the algorithm shepherds you. Or maybe it's a little bit of those things, but the reality is you are the shepherd of your life. You are your own shepherd, self-shepherding. That's the life that you're living. And you very likely are a better shepherd than some politicians and some of the things I mentioned. I'll give you that. But it is a dangerous life to live as a sheep when you try to be the shepherd. When you are designed to be led, but you decide to lead yourself. And that's human nature. We want to do that. But when you are your own shepherd as a broken human being, here's what happens. At times in your life, the shepherd, what's leading you is your emotions, your feelings, which are different right now than they were an hour ago. Based on driving here, getting here, if you've eaten or not this morning, and yet we will let what we feel lead us. We live in a culture that says, whatever you feel, that's right, just let that lead you in your life, your emotions. Or maybe for you, it's your logic. It's what you think, that I know best. I'm the ultimate authority. I will lead myself by what I decide, what I think. As one finite human being who's lived in one era of history for a couple decades of life experience in one cultural worldview, but I know best. I'm the ultimate authority. My logic will lead me. Maybe, just talking real, your hormones may be what leads in your life. And your biggest decisions are made based off of those and what you're feeling, what you want. We as human beings, we want to lead ourselves when in reality we need to be saved from ourselves because we are prone to wander. But we wanna be our own shepherds or we'll be led by some of these other things. And then here comes Jesus. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And when he says this, this is a massive moment. So let's catch up where we've been, Gospel of John. In this gospel, this account of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, Jesus makes seven I am statements, revealing to us who he is. And recently, he's made this group of Pharisees, 
who he's arguing with right now. He's teeing off on these guys. He's made them very mad. Two chapters ago in John chapter eight, he defended a woman caught in adultery from these Pharisees killing her. John chapter nine, he heals a blind man on the Sabbath, breaks some of their rules. These Pharisees do not like Jesus. Then he says, I am the door, I am salvation. And then he backs that up and says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. I am the good shepherd. And when he says this, he's bringing an indictment on the leaders, the shepherds, right in front of him. And he's revealing his identity and his character, who he is to the audience listening. When they hear him say, I am the good shepherd, they're not all kind of like us because they have more context to the moment in the Old Testament scriptures that are going off in their heads right now. They're not all like interesting metaphors. He's saying that we're like sheep because we're dumb. Did you know koalas are dumber than sheep? Like that's not what they're thinking. When he says this, the Pharisees go, wait, who did he just say he was? The good shepherd? The audience of people that the Pharisees called sinners that are all watching and listening to Jesus in this interaction, they're going, wait, who did he just say he was? The good shepherd? The one we've been waiting for? All through the Old Testament, which was their scriptures, this nation, these people of God, they have been referred to as sheep without a shepherd. Sheep without a shepherd. And at times, God himself says, calls himself the shepherd of Israel, like in Psalm 80. The shepherd of Israel. They're hearing this, and Jesus is making the boldest claim that he could, that he is the shepherd that they've been waiting for. There are some scriptures going off in the Pharisees' heads right now. One of those is Ezekiel chapter 34. When God speaks through the prophet Ezekiel, and here's what he says about shepherding. Ezekiel 34, starting in verse 1, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds, clothe yourselves with the wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You have ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. And Jesus right now, he's triggering the Pharisees because he's likening them to these kinds of shepherds. He's saying, you're bad shepherds. You have ruled these people harshly and brutally. You can tell the way the shepherd leads by the quality of life of the sheep. You can tell the type of shepherd by how the sheep live. And in this passage, you can hear all of the things that have happened to the people because of bad shepherding. I was reading that passage and thinking of right now the time we live in with all the things I mentioned, of all these bad shepherds out there that lead our lives. And I started to just make a list of what that produces, what bad shepherds bring, just for, out of this passage that is so true for us today. Bad shepherds bring scarcity, neglect, uncertainty, confusion, isolation, volatility, anger, anxiety, fear, abuse, hopelessness, helplessness, apathy, selfishness, Division, and I just stopped at 15. It's like, this has gotten depressing enough. <laughs> but for a lot of us, we would say there's multiple words on here, a lot of things that that's what my life looks like, and it's likely it's because of the shepherding that's happening in your life. Maybe it's religion. Maybe it's been religious experiences in your life that have led to this. Just like Jesus is calling out, you haven't cared for the flock. You have ruled them harshly and brutally and led them into lives with all this kind of stuff. You can tell the type of shepherd by the quality of life of the sheep. And so when Jesus says, I, I'm the good shepherd, he's calling them out and he's also telling them that he is an answer to the promise that God has made. Ezekiel 34, go to verse 11. For this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search for my sheep and look after them. As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them, so will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from the places where they were scattered on a day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out of the nations and gather them from the countries and I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel in the ravines and all the settlements in the land. I will tend them in good pasture and the mountain heights of Israel will be their grazing land. There they will lie down in good grazing land and there will be feed in a rich pasture on the mountains of Israel. I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the sovereign Lord. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured and strengthen the weak, but the sleek and the strong I will destroy. I will shepherd the flock with justice. 
Skip to verse 22. I will save my flock, and they will no longer be plundered. I will judge between one sheep and another, and I will place over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he will tend them. He will tend them and be their shepherd. I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. Now, this is, we're in deep waters here. There's some theological layers to this passage. When Jesus is making the claim, I am the good shepherd, he is saying all of the promise, all of the prophecy that one day a shepherd, a leader, the king of all kings will come, I'm him and I'm here. I am the answer to all of this. And this is a very specific call of a good shepherd. When he says David, everyone's brains go off, right? They think of David. David was their great king. But before he was the greatest king in their history, he was the greatest shepherd. He was a shepherd king. And it was David, the shepherd king, who prophesied, and many other prophets along the way, who talked about the king of kings who would come, the shepherd of all shepherds who would come. David wrote Psalm 23, the other scripture that's going off in their heads right now, about the good shepherd. He wrote that centuries before Ezekiel prophesied that God will be the shepherd that will send his servant to be the shepherd. And centuries later, Jesus comes. So what Ezekiel is not saying is, we're gonna get David out of his tomb. He's been dead for a couple hundred years. We're gonna get him out of the tomb, and he's gonna lead again. Now, all of these prophecies speak of David because it has been prophesied that from the line, the family line of David, that the king of all kings, the shepherd of all shepherds would come. And Jesus is claiming to be him. He says, I am the good shepherd, revealing his identity, the promised shepherd, the promised savior, and also his character, the type of shepherd he is. It's really interesting to me, this is the only I am statement with an adjective. He didn't say, I am the good bread, or the good light, or the good door. But here he doesn't just say, I am the shepherd. He says, I am the good shepherd. To an audience of people who have had a whole lot of shepherds, bad shepherds, who have lived lives of bad shepherding, and he says, I'm here and I'm different than all the shepherds you've ever had. I'm the one that God said would come, and this is how I lead. Listen to Psalm 23, just close your eyes and listen to this. This is the type of shepherd he is. David, the great shepherd king, he starts with, the Lord is my shepherd. I'm not the guy, he's the guy. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside quiet waters, he refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies, you anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. The most famous psalm that is going off in everybody's heads right now. The Pharisees are like, who's this guy claiming to be? And all these hopeful people who've been marginalized and pushed away by bad shepherding are going, wait, wait, wait. Could it be that the good shepherd is here? That kind of shepherd who's come for us? A different type of shepherd? I was reading through this psalm and Ezekiel and, and what Jesus is claiming right here in John 10 and thinking about how, how much of a contrast that kind of a life, that kind of shepherding is to all of the bad shepherding that we live under. How different the things that he brings are. You may ask the question that some people in that circle were asking, what's so good about you, shepherd? What makes you the good shepherd? And I started to make a different list of all the things I see just right here in this psalm that the good shepherd brings in contrast to what bad shepherding brings. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. The good shepherd brings provision. He provides for his flock. You have all that you need when you have the good shepherd. Some of the most content people I know have very little materially, very little of the things that the world wants, but they have peace and contentment. Why? Because they know that I have all I need if I have my shepherd. He will provide for me. He provides for his flock. And what does he do? What does that tell us about who he is? He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. In the face of bad shepherding that's filled with neglect and attack and hurt, brutality, the good shepherd brings care and refreshment and healing. Green pastures, quiet waters. Simon Sinek says leadership is not about taking charge. It's about taking care of those you're in charge of. And Jesus embodies that better than anyone ever has. The good shepherd who comes to bind up the brokenhearted, to heal the sick, care, refreshment, healing. I love worshiping up at our campus in Gatesville. 
I love going up there because when you are in there in a service, you're in the midst of a group of people in a room filled with worship of people who have found green pasture in a prison, who have realized that green pasture is not based on circumstance or geography, but it's based on the shepherd. The shepherd who has green pasture for us, who has a life for us, no matter what life looks like today. He leads me to green pastures to fill me with life, not all the things on that first list, but life. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Guides me. The good shepherd brings direction to a directionless world of so many people. I hear all the time, I don't know what to do with my life. I have no purpose. I have no idea where to go. I don't know what next step to take. And rather than being fed with worldly opinions, we get godly wisdom, direction from the good shepherd of where to go. All for what? His namesake. To lead you to what he has for you, which is always better than what you can shepherd yourself into. Always. Even though I walk through the darkest valley or the valley of shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The good shepherd brings protection. There is protection in the presence of the good shepherd. It says that he carries a rod. That's what shepherds would carry to fight, to defend the flock. You may remember David killed a bear and a lion. Why? Because they were gonna come try to kill his sheep. So he went at them, fought them. The good shepherd will protect you and Jesus has come to protect you from the ultimate enemy. The enemy of your soul that wants to kill, steal, and destroy. Death, sin, Jesus himself has come with a rod to fight for you so that you can walk without fear of the enemy. You can walk without fear of death. You can walk without fear because you know that he's with you, that he's walked through that valley. So the good shepherd brings protection, but the good shepherd also brings correction. Sometimes protection looks like correction. He has a rod and a staff, and the staff had a curved end so that the shepherd could grab a sheep's neck when they started to wander away. And we don't really like when that happens. We're like, ugh, you got me. I wanted to go that way. And he goes, no, you're gonna die over there. There's a wolf right over there. Stay here with me. Because a good shepherd has boundaries. A good shepherd has boundaries. We like to resist them. But a good, loving shepherd will do what he has to do to keep us safe. And sometimes protection, the thing you need to be protected from more than anything else is yourself. Sometimes you need to be pulled back over. I've read that some shepherds, they have sheep that just wander and wander and wander, and so they will break a sheep's leg and then carry it around their neck until it heals. We're all in our time, we're like, oh, that is horrible. Back then, they're like, that's how you shepherd, to keep them safe. Because once that sheep heals, it will never leave the, shep- leave the shepherd's side. Like if my son is gonna run into the street, I will tackle that fool into the sidewalk. (laughs) And he's not gonna like getting tackled. He might get a little scuffed up, but he will like when he finds out that I saved him from what was gonna kill him. And it may sound a little cruel for a shepherd to do that, except for the fact that the shepherd is the one who carries the sheep, heals the sheep, cares for it, and then leads it to walk in life. A good shepherd has boundaries and will protect you with correction when you need it. There are studies that talk about like they can put kids out into an open field and they won't really know what to do. They won't really like play and run around because they don't feel safe. But you could put a fence around that field and then you put them there and they will flourish and play and have a great time because they feel safe, because they have boundaries. They have protection. And we may like to be rebellious in our flesh, but deep down within us, we crave the correction of a loving parent. Because when you get correction, it means that your parent cares, that your shepherd cares enough to to not let you just wander away into what's gonna kill you. And what David finds through this protection and correction is comfort. The good shepherd brings comfort. I find comfort because you are with me. And in times of protection, in times of correction, I know that you're with me. I can walk through the darkest valley, but I know that you're with me. No one has walked through a darker valley than Jesus. The good shepherd who had all of sin and death, who took it all on himself, in himself, and walk through the darkest of all valleys, which means in your life, there is no valley he can't walk you through. There is no valley that intimidates him. No valley that he's afraid of. He says in John, I don't run from a fight. I will walk you right through that valley. And you can be comforted along the journey. The good shepherd also brings victory. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Victory and blessing overflowing from the good shepherd. 
Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Some translations say goodness and mercy because this isn't some sort of transactional, cheap, worldly love. This is unconditional, forgiving, merciful love. The good shepherd brings mercy. And it says that his goodness and love, his goodness and mercy, that they follow me all the days of my life. It's like his goodness and mercy, like Jesus kind of stalks you, just following you around. You're going over here, I'll go over here. Here's some goodness, here's some mercy. Okay, we're going this way, all right, you wanna go back this way? All right, goodness and mercy, goodness. He's followed some of you in here. Why is everyone around me talking about Jesus? Why do I keep getting invited to church? Why do I keep thinking about God, asking big questions? He's just following you around, goodness and mercy, goodness. Oh, we're going this way, you wanna go to the bar? I'll go to the bar with you, let's go. You going to your friend's house? I'll be there, I'd love to be with you, I just wanna be with you. I'll just follow you around with goodness and mercy. Oh, we're going, okay. He will follow you, his goodness and mercy will follow you. Jesus is the one who said he would leave the 99 to go find the lost one. He goes, you, you bad shepherds, you don't go seek the strays, you don't go find them, I'll go get them myself. I will go look for them, I will pursue them. That's what the good shepherd brings, pursuit. He will pursue you, follow you all the days of your life because ultimately he wants to bring relationship to you. Jesus says, my sheep know my voice. It was common for shepherds that they would name their sheep and they would call their sheep, kind of like we do with dogs, and the sheep would follow them. Sheep are not so dumb after all, it turns out. They would learn the voice of their shepherd and follow them. He says, I'm speaking, I'm calling to you. I know my sheep and they know me. It's one of the things we take for granted that is so crazy to me that the God who created all of this wants a relationship with you. Even crazier, he wants a relationship with me, of all people. I think a lot of us think that Jesus kind of just has to put up with us. Like the father was like, I need you to do this cross thing. And Jesus is like, for them? Seriously? A bunch of koalas down there. Not worth it. Now Jesus says he, he says, I willingly lay my life down for my sheep. It's so crazy. He, he knows you. And not even that, he understands you. Bad shepherding makes us feel so vulnerable and misunderstood, but the good shepherd understands you at your deepest places of pain, the hardest places in your life, the greatest things about you. He knows and understands all of it. He likes you. He wants to be with you. He's just following you around with goodness and mercy. He speaks to you. We have his word and his spirit. He will speak to you. The God who spoke stars into existence, he is speaking, he is calling to you. How crazy is that? The question for us is not, is the shepherd speaking? It's, are his sheep listening? Are we listening for his voice because he's calling to us, he's speaking to us? And all of this for what? So that we can have some good lives right in the here and now? Yes, and, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It's the last line of this psalm, surely, your goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The good shepherd brings a promise, a promise of forever, that when you let him be Lord and leader and shepherd of your life, you are with him forever. You are in his flock forever. All made possible through the ultimate thing that he has come to bring, which is salvation. To save his sheep so that they can dwell in his house forever, which was promised in Ezekiel 34, verse 25, God himself, he says, I will make a covenant of peace with them and rid the land of savage beasts so that they may live in the wilderness and sleep in the forest in safety. He talks about all the blessing. I will save my flock. And he concludes with this, you are my sheep, my sheep, the sheep of my pasture. And I am your God, declares the sovereign Lord. So let's jump back to John 10. We just did a little Old Testament survey about shepherding where Jesus is making this claim and they're all going, who did he just say he was? He is the good shepherd who's come to save the flock, to make the covenant of peace. Here's what Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. This is a crazy statement. He is claiming to be the good shepherd and what is the proof of his promise? His sacrifice. His sacrifice will be the proof of his promise of who he's claiming to be. 
The story of bad shepherding is always the sheep dying for the shepherd, but this is the story of the shepherd coming to die for his sheep. This is a crazy idea. And Jesus is saying, how will you know that I'm the good shepherd? I will lay my life down for my sheep. I'm not a hired hand. All of you bad shepherds, you treat these people like, all you do, if danger comes, you just take off. Have it the flock, just don't hurt me. You just care for yourselves. But me, I don't run from a fight. I've come with a rod and a staff and I will lead my people into life, into freedom, into salvation. How will I do it? I will lay my life down for them. And so if you need some hope in this place today, your hope is not tied to a, an empty promise or a pipe dream from a cool teacher 2,000 years ago. Your hope is tethered to a promise that God made that he fulfilled through his son who came here, the good shepherd, and laid his life down for you. The good shepherd dies for his sheep. That's how he proves to us that he is the good shepherd, that he dies for his sheep. And I have to believe as he does that, there was a moment where the enemy might have thought he won. He's like, oh, shepherd's on the cross and all the sheep have scattered. I've scattered the flock and he's gonna die. But then on Sunday morning, here comes that good shepherd. Just like he said he would. Verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep and I must bring them also. He's talking about Gentiles. He's talking about your neighbor that you go, God, you don't wanna save this person. I'm coming for everybody. Everybody's invited. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life. Shepherd dies for a sheep, but only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. How do we know that he's the good shepherd? This is a big statement to make. That's some big talk. You better back that up. How do we know that he's the good shepherd? Because he did it. He laid his life down for a sheep, and then he took his life up again to give you eternal life so you can dwell in his house forever. That is the promise of the good shepherd. The good shepherd dies for a sheep, and then he comes back, and he's got a plan for us. Then the good shepherd unites his sheep. He says, I'm calling all my sheep from everywhere, every tribe, tongue, and nation. I'm calling everybody, uniting my sheep together. Maybe you've had that call. Maybe you've been following the good shepherd in your life. But maybe right now you feel a little scattered that you've wandered away. There's some other shepherding happening in your life. Maybe you're not walking right next to the good shepherd right now. Let me encourage you with the story of the disciples. That when the good shepherd went to die for his sheep, when he went to lay his life down, they all scattered. You think about Peter? He was kind of the leader of the pack. When Jesus is on the cross, he's nowhere to be found. That dude's scattered. And then here comes that good shepherd, resurrected Jesus, and what does he do? He pursues Peter. He goes and finds Peter. John 21, read the story. Peter's out fishing, and Jesus shows up on the shore and calls to him, and Peter jumps out of the boat and swims to him. He can't believe this shepherd is so good that he would come find Peter in his darkest valley. And he comes and finds him, Jesus cooking breakfast on the beach to hang with the boys. That's what he wants to do, resurrected Jesus. And he has an interaction with Peter and he restores him. But he doesn't just restore Peter and then be like, okay, we're cool, try not to mess this up. He calls him. What's the last thing Jesus says to Peter? Three times, feed my sheep. That is the purpose of your life now, feed my sheep, feed them. And Peter got it. Peter was closer to koala than sheep on the scale we're talking about, but he got it. He writes this in a letter to the church, 1 Peter chapter five. He says, this is his instruction to us, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing, as God wants you to be, not pursuing dishonest gain, but eager to serve, not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. You wanna lead in the kingdom of God. First, like Peter, you gotta know that you are sheep, that you are prone to wander and you need to be led. But you have a good shepherd who will come pursue you and find you and restore you, and he's calling you. The good shepherd dies for his sheep, and then he unites his sheep, and then the good shepherd commissions his sheep. Simple instruction for your life. What do I do? I wanna follow the good shepherd, feed his sheep. Feed them, lead them to the chief shepherd. It's like we as the church, we're all these sheep on this green pasture we have the gift of eternal life. We have all the things of heaven to feed us and fill us. But out in the distance, there's some sheep on desolate fields with bad shepherds, ruling them cruelly, harshly, brutally, living lives so filled with that first list, thirsty for what's on that second list. And we have the chance to go invite them to come meet our shepherd. Hey, you gotta come meet my shepherd. 
He's unlike any other, other shepherd. He's beyond your wildest dreams and his goodness and his mercy that's following you. Come to my field and eat this. This is what you need. So if you're following the good shepherd, the instruction for your life is feed his sheep. Lead them to the chief shepherd. For those of you in here that you are not following the good shepherd, maybe you were for a time and you've wandered away and you no longer have a relationship, or maybe you've never called on him as Lord and leader and shepherd of your life. Maybe you've never felt invited. Maybe you felt unqualified. I wanna share a story with you that might speak to right where you're at. In the early 2000s, there was a famous sheep in New Zealand. You may have heard this story named Shrek, named after the movie character, obviously. Don't know why I said that. That's, not, that's the first time that word ever existed, so why would it not be that? Anyway, <laughs> this sheep wandered away from the flock, wandered away from his shepherd, and lived on his own for six years. Six years out in caves and kind of just surviving on his own. And after six years, his shepherd found him. And this is what he looked like when they found Shrek after six years. Look at this dude. It looks like something out of a Pixar movie, right? Also, must be cool to live in New Zealand. Look at the background of that. It looks Photoshopped. It's like, oh, let me grab a quick picture with my sheep. Here's the mountain range from the Lord of the Rings right behind us. We're taking pictures and it's like, oh, here's Highway 35 behind us. It looks so, look at this parking garage. Oh, that's, must be nice. After six years, they find Shrek and that's what he looks like. And it's funny, he looks ridiculous, but it's actually incredibly miraculous that he survived. Very dangerous for a sheep to live like this because as that wool grows, I read that he had like 20 jackets worth of wool on him. It's so easy for infection and disease to spread. It's really, really amazing that he survived. By the time they found him, he could barely walk or function as a sheep. And I look at that picture and I feel like that looks like so many of our souls that have wandered away from the good shepherd. So burdened and heavy laden with the things of this world, so much that's on us, weighing us down. All the things from that first list that we resonate with of helplessness and hopelessness and anxiety and fear, all this stuff that is weighing us down. Well, the shepherd found his sheep and he sheared him. And this is what he looked like after his shepherd was able to care for him. All through this weekend, the most response, every single service, this entire sermon that is about the good shepherd dying for you, the most response in this sermon is everyone like, look at that sheep, he looks so good, he's back. <laughs> but you'll remember it. Shrek is born again. He looks like a sheep again. He could walk around and go live and go back to the pastures with his shepherd, and I just feel like for so many of you, it's time for you to come to your shepherd and let him start to take all this stuff off of you and on him. What did he say? Come to me if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, and I will give you rest. I'm the good shepherd. I will care for you. I will shear you. I will take all of the things that bad shepherding has put onto your life, and I will fill you with a new life of goodness and mercy. I'm following you, coming to find you. And some people in this room, maybe this is, this is that moment for you. I'll give you that chance. For all of us, my, my whole agenda today was just that you would get your eyes on the goodness of our shepherd that you would see how good of a shepherd you have. A lot of times I think we get church backwards. I notice this, especially here on Sunday mornings in this room. We think that we come to church to learn a little more information about the good shepherd when we actually gather together as his flock to worship the good shepherd. And I see sometimes like as soon as a message ends, people just bolt out of here. Right when worship is starting, the important part where you get to connect and experience the goodness of your shepherd. You go up to our Murray unit, they are not leaving early. And I know some of you got small bladders or you gotta beat the parking lot, you're trying to survive out there, I get it. But man, we miss out on the experience, the moments of worship where we get to be in the presence of the good shepherd and experience his green pastures. Quiet waters where for once in our lives, it's actually quiet and we could hear his voice. You know how loud water is? You ever been next to a river or try to have a conversation while waves are crashing on the ocean? It is loud. But he brings us to quiet waters so what? He, we can hear his voice. Last week during worship, I was in multiple services, kind of just looking around the room. I know that's kind of like weird to do during worship, just like watching people. I work here, so I can do that. <laughs> but I, it was like people were being illuminated to me, people that I know, and I know their stories. And I was seeing them in the passion of worship, just like so far beyond worrying about what people in the room were thinking, just like connecting with God, their good shepherd. 
And worship is about passion. It's about authentically experiencing God. It's not about performance. But I was looking at some of these people. I see this couple that their marriage has been to hell and back. But they have seen the good shepherd walk them through their darkest valley and come out the other side into new life and green pasture, just worshiping so passionately. And close to them, another couple who met serving at this church. And they're in this beautiful time of joy and provision celebrating what the good shepherd has brought into their lives and a few people over someone who's in some deep pain and loss right now, but worshiping the good shepherd nonetheless because he's bringing them comfort in that valley. Somebody I know that's been broken free of spiritual bondage in their life, just worshiping, seeing the chains fall off. Someone I know who's had years of addiction conquered because of the power of Jesus in their life, worshiping. And I look around and I need moments like that. I need moments up at the marina where I just see People so passionately experiencing the goodness of their shepherd and just returning to him the praise and, and glory that he's worth. Because it reminds me, they're not worshiping because the service was good. They're not worshiping because the sermon was good. They're worshiping because the shepherd is good. And for early in my faith, I get it. If you're one of those people, you stand in here with your arms crossed, you're like, what are we doing now? What's with the music part? We had a Google review once. It's my favorite Google review ever. Emily loves this. This guy goes, good church, could do with all that could do without all that singing, but still pretty good. <laughs> and I remember showing up to church and I'm like, what is with these Christian people trying to high five God? Like, what are they doing? Putting their hands up in the air and some people are jumping around, standing there looking at the words. Like, what does this mean? I think for a lot of us, I bring no judgment if that's you. You just, you just need to know how good your shepherd is. And maybe you don't right now, but you'll only find his goodness through relationship with him. And so your invitation is to step into one with him. And what you will find when you come to the good shepherd is that he cares for you. He has healing for you, restoration for you. He's been pursuing you, calling to you, mercy and goodness, just stalking you because he loves you, made a promise to you that he kept on the cross. He brought you salvation and eternal life. You can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So if you would stand to your feet right now, I wanna read a blessing from Hebrews chapter 13 over everybody in this room, commissioning some of you to go out this week and invite some people to Green Pasture. And then invite some of you to come to the Good Shepherd. Come home like Shrek. If you would hold your hands out, just in a posture of receiving, Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead, our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever, amen. With every eye closed in here, if you are one of those people that you feel like Shrek and you're like, man, I need to come home. I need to, I need to let Jesus lead in my life. I want that relationship with him that he died for me to have. I want that eternal, I wanna be with him, dwell in his house forever, be led by him, let he be, him be Lord of my life. If that's you, I just ask that you bravely put your hand up so I can see you, just so I know who I'm praying with in this place. I see all over this room. Hey, I'm gonna pray and just, you, you pray with me, you put these into your words. You have this moment where you get to call on that good shepherd who's been seeking you and start this relationship. So Jesus, I thank you that you came here for me, the good shepherd, that you laid down your life for me. Today I put my faith in you as Lord and Savior of my life. I thank you that you died for me on the cross to pay for my sins and that you rose from the grave to give me eternal life. And today I call back to you, I hear your voice, my good shepherd, and I claim that salvation, put my faith in you, a relationship with you. I thank you for what you've done for me. Would you lead me and guide me as my Lord, Savior, and Shepherd? In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, Red Rocks, and we make some noise for people all over this room today that put their faith in Jesus. And right now, as one church family, as the flock gathered together, may we worship our Good Shepherd all together.
of your forgiveness reflected in the light of your All I ever want was you All I ever need was you So take the world, take it all But give me Jesus I'd have been for
with the name above every name. Man, we have a good God, amen? And uh, heaven just got more crowded today. Can we make some noise for that? To all of you who just put your faith in Jesus, congratulations. Uh, best decision you'll ever make, and that is the understatement of 2024. And in case you're wondering what the heck do I do now, we do have some next steps and resources to help you. If you just text the word yes to 30301, we want nothing from you. We just want to give you some resources and offer some, some next steps. But once again, congratulations to you. If you're in here and you need prayer for anything, we have an amazing prayer team. Give it up for the prayer team, by the way. Y'all are warriors, literally warriors for our church, for the kingdom of God. And if you need prayer, you're crazy if you don't stop and get prayer. That team is amazing. Go see the prayer team on your way out. And man, I just, I love that message. I was thinking about David in Psalm 23 earlier this week, and I read it with the tone of, of him bragging. And I love it. And now I can't unsee it when he said, the Lord is my shepherd, and I lack nothing because of it. I don't know who your shepherd is, but the Lord, imagine a sheep bragging about his shepherd. He's mine. He takes care of everything that I need. The Lord is my good shepherd. And if I could just challenge you and encourage you around the area of generosity like we do every single week because Jesus talks such a big game about it. As one of the shepherds of this church, thank you for letting us pastor you around this topic. I know there can be so much church baggage that comes with it. That's why we say balancing statements like if you're hurting and you need cash for dinner tonight, take cash from that basket on your way out. And if you don't trust this place, give to a different church. I'll give you a list of 10 churches and I'm not kidding. And the reason we say those things and mean it, first of all, God's got this church. He has done nothing but prove that for five years. But also, man, I just trying to remove any reason or excuse that's human away from us answering this question. When it comes to your finances, who is shepherding you? Is it the good shepherd or is it maybe your fears? Is it culture? Is it church baggage? Is it your wants? Or is it the good shepherd? Because in order for him to be your shepherd, you gotta let him shepherd every part of your life. That's why Jesus taught finances because he knows that's like the last thing we let him shepherd us, you know? And so that's why we, we make those balancing statements all the time. Um, so that I can, I can get you to, to maybe come face to face with the good shepherd and answer that question in, in your heart. Why am I not fully trusting this good shepherd with, with finances? I know it's the number one cause of like divorce in our country is money. It's the number one thing that causes sleepless nights. It's the number one cause for that first list that Ethan put up on this screen with all that weight and all that, that fear of the future. But when you just say, God, I'm gonna let you shepherd me. Let's do this your way. You trade list one for list two and when you do this his way I mean that according to Jesus that is what does it look like for you to return the first fruits the first 10% of what comes in back to him so he can bless the other 90 to do way more than that original 100 could have ever done on its own and then he occasionally calls us even to go above and beyond and whether that's here or anywhere be a generous person not just because the world needs you to but because you need you to let the good shepherd shepherd you when it comes to your treasure if that's here just know we're going to continue you need to make heaven more crowded as long as God lets this place have a heartbeat. You can give on our app. You can you can do online, redrocksaustin.com slash give. You can set up recurring giving where you just live that way and you don't have that battle every two weeks. You can put cash or check in that basket. Once again, you can take cash for dinner if you need it on your way out. Just don't take any checks. That's just weird and it's not going to help you. All right? But let the good shepherd shepherd every part of your life. That's my challenge to you. Hey, in 13 minutes, we have the welcome party. So if you just put your faith in Jesus or you're relatively new around here, this is a next step for your faith. So simple. Out those doors to the left. Welcome party at 1145. Please be our guest. And next week, service times are different. All right? And so I believe it's 730. I want to invite you all to the 730, by the way. I'm telling you, I will not even preach good at the 915 because I'm gonna give everything that I got to that 730, that sunrise service. But uh, grab some of those cards on your way out so you can invite friends. Be here next week for Good Friday and then an Easter service. We can't wait to celebrate with you guys. Love you so much, Red Rocks. Have a good Holy Week.
Can I see you this weekend? We can sit and just stare at the ceiling. Oh, I just wanna know what you're feeling. Yeah, okay. Are you free in the morning? I was thinking of grabbing some coffee. There's a pretty good place around the corner. I think we'll have a
think I'd rather stay on the floor But you're welcome to join me if you wanna rain some more Got a night for a rerun But that could change if you ask me nice things I don't know what we're doing but stay with me I promise we'll have an okay be here wish i could skip past all the drama but i need to be clear to let go i can't leave us hanging it kills me because i love the way i've been going through changes but i know when you were so fake and made me lose my patience breaking fake and love now i'm so stuck on 